Thank you so much for coming. It's standing room only. I'm so very, very, very good. Thank you. Of course, my students had to be here. So thank you again for those of you who came. If you haven't gotten pizza, please, by all means, feel free to do so. There is a sign-in sheet going around. Everyone needs to sign that. All right, so make sure you do that. And um, we are recording this lecture. So if anybody has objections to that, please let me know. So I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Rob Wells. He has a very distinguished career as a journalist. He worked for the Wall Street Journal, where he was the DC Bureau Chief. He worked for Bloomberg News. He also worked for the Associated Press. He is currently a professor here at the University of Maryland, and he's working on a lynching project. Uh, it's a special, special course, a special topics course. course. So for my first year students, as you work through the program, make sure you look for those types of courses and opportunities to take care of Maryland. Before coming here, Dr. Wells was at the University of Arkansas. And today, today he's gonna to talk to you about his latest book uh, on Kiplinger. And so I will turn the floor over to Rob. Thank you so very much. So did we go through all the pizza yet? No, there's plenty more. No, 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 no. Right. So thank you all for coming. It's great to see you here. It's great to see everybody enjoying lunch, which is the main reason we're here, of course. But uh, yeah, appreciate it. I, I wanted to talk about um, you know, my, my book here, it's called The Insider, came out on University of Massachusetts Press um, late last year. And it's about a, a journalist who worked in DC for many years. His name is uh, Willard Kiplinger. Um, has anybody ever heard of Kiplinger? Yeah. A couple of minutes back there. Um, he founded this thing called the Kiplinger Washington Letter and then the Kiplinger Personal Finance Magazine. And this book is part biography, it's part history. It's um, and it looks at innovations in journalism. In this case, uh, innovations in specialized journalism, and um, and then it also looks at the role of a reporter who was a political actor during a really important time in our country's history. That was during the New Deal, and exactly what that the political action was was all about. So I'm going to talk about journalism history, but I want you know. Students here ask to think about history in journalism, about how to contextualize the role of journalists in the broader scheme of social and economic and political events. So think about history in journalism. Um, so this this story begins, you know, about some 90, 100 years ago. And I think it can really teach a lot about uh, journalism today. I'm going to kind of talk about the, a lot of the contemporary themes that came out of this historical research. Um, let me just ask a couple questions here to get us going. How many of you are interested in working for yourself someday? Hands, okay. So Kiplinger's examples here that I'll talk about really provide a nice roadmap of how to do that. And we'll talk, we'll talk about the risks that it took to get there. Um, if you follow Kiplinger's roadmap, you would be able to start your own website. Be able to start your own YouTube channel. You could uh, you could do things like that without a doubt. And he did all this with the technology of his era back in the twenties, and it was newsletters. I'll talk about newsletters and why they're important. And newsletters are also really current. And the very um, the digital form of newsletters are a big trend now in contemporary journalism. Um, the other question for everybody: How many have had trouble getting your calls returned? on a story, right? So the Kiplinger method that I, that I studied going through archives and his letters, just kind of give like a case study of how to be an outstanding reporter, how to build your network. And I'll talk a couple about a couple examples about that. Um, he, got, he got his calls returned and that's because he was really good about doing the people side of journalism, really working with that. And, uh, I know we have some people from outside the journalism college, but how many of you are trying to get a job in journalism after you graduate? They're just about everybody. 
So you'll probably hear this time and time again in this college, especially if you're going to talk to me. But you need to be looking at um, at other forms of journalism, and business reporting is one of those forms, and it can be very rewarding, believe it or not. Um, I was surprised I fell into it um, during my time at the AP, and like Kiplinger, you know, I was following the money. I was following where, what was happening with finance, and that led to a lot of insights on politics. So looking at that nexus of money and politics can is just a great um, uh, format for, for doing great uh, art, article. Um, then I'm going to follow up with uh, some uh, examples of how I did archival research and how all that works. So just a little bit of background about this guy. Uh, Willard Kiplinger was born in Bellefonte, Ohio, Central Ohio in 1891, and he died in Bethesda in uh, 1967. He was one of the first journalism graduates from Ohio State University. They had actually just started a journalism program. He was one of the first uh, graduates. Then. then he went to work at Ohio State Journal and then, um, then to the AP in, uh, in, in Columbus, Ohio. And there's one lesson that's really important from Kiplinger's early life. You can see it at the AP in Columbus. He would take these big risks to advance his career and to sort of uh, go forward, and they usually paid off. He wanted to get transferred to the AP in Washington, and the Columbus bureau chief at the AP would not let him do it. And so he quit. He quit his job, prestigious job, working for the AP in, in Ohio, drove to Washington, and talked his way into a night editing job. So he got his transfer. And he did this time and time again. He would take these kind of like you know, roll the dice, uh, big gambles, and they really paid off for his uh, um, career. So he's in Washington in 1916, working for the AP, and he had these really cool assignments, like following the president of the United States around Washington at night when he went for a walk. <laughs> the president, Woodrow Wilson, would go for a walk at night, and there had to be an AP reporter there. Why do you think there had to be an AP reporter with the president? Something happened like right. It's kind of this grisly thing called the Death Watch assignment. And right now they have it. Um, the press pool in, in DC will have like two big like vans following the president around all over all over town. But he used to just go walking with the president at night. We also got some other good scoops like covering you know uh, women's rights act uh, advocates who are trying to get the right to vote. And they got jailed for protesting at the uh, at the White House, but he eventually found that the AP's um, Washington bureau was very conservative and very restrictive, and the news values at that time were basically to accept what the government said as sort of like the ultimate truth, and not really to go beyond that. There was little little challenge of that in, in the hard news environment of the AP. And so he, he really wanted to kind of follow the money to really get under the story, find out what's going on with uh, power and politics. And he ended up getting an expertise in banking and finance in the Washington Bureau. And this allowed him to break some stories and he still wanted to go deeper, but the, um, uh, the AP wouldn't let him do it. So he, um, he ended up, um, you know, taking, um, you know, a, 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 a leap out of uh, out of the AP and go into a new uh, to a new venture. He quit the AP and worked for a bank for a little bit as a as an analyst, and then he went um, to start his own um, uh, uh, business. Here is an example of of the sort of stature that he had uh, during uh, the twenties and thirties. Real books and was quite well known in the country. So. When he had quit the AP and he started his own business in 1923, the Kiplinger Washington Letter. And for anybody who's kind of started, you know, looked at um, business classes and so forth, you have to have, you know, some basic ideas of, of what your new publication is going to do. And so he picked up on this trend in the audience at the time that there was an information overload. And this is in the early 20s that people were overloaded with books and magazines and newspapers. 
we think we're overloaded today, but this was like a very big deal. And it was a, a lot of other journalists had picked up this as well. Um, DeWitt and Lila Wallace picked up on this information overload trend and founded Reader's Digest about this time. Uh, we had uh, Henry Luce and Britton Hayden founded Time Magazine all trying to deal with this issue of information overload, providing a little bit more succinct information to folks. Kiplinger's uh, saw this business opportunity within the, the corporate sphere and to provide analysis and then predictions about what would happen. So it was providing journalism and also kind of like consulting on you know, what you could do with this information. So in the language of startups, he, he had this sell a business opportunity to invite it. He saw a customer need and a value proposition, which was this short and very well edited newsletter. And it, he kept it to four pages no matter what, and uh, did a couple um, other things that were very, very innovative at the time. And so here's what the newsletter looked like. Nothing, no graphics, very dry looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it was it was really quite um uh became extremely popular in the time because of how it would tell the business community what was happening in Washington. And that was actually not um something that was being done at a, at a great uh, in great detail by other com competitors like Forbes or Fortune and so forth. Just to talk a little bit about newsletters, there's, there's quite a history. Um, they're really a big deal now in the news business. Some of you will probably be getting jobs writing for newsletters. A lot of my friends are, are writing for newsletters as well, and they're digital newsletters. They look a little bit fancier than this, but they, they're popular because they have a high reader engagement and they meet specific information needs. And this has been the history of newsletters throughout the time. So Politico is kind of following this model, and Axios and Skim and some others are examples of modern uh, digital newsletters that really followed on the um, on the heels of the innovations of, of Kiplinger. Newsletters have been around for centuries. <clears throat> there is a study that traced handwritten newsletters back to uh, before in the Roman Empire and into China in the Chang Dynasty. Um, newsletters in the 16th and 17th centuries were basically the foundation of modern business journalism, the Fugger newsletters in Europe that wrote about uh, what was happening with trade and the intersection of business and, and this sort of information was really essential for the rise of capitalism you can't have a stock market without news. And so these things were really intertwined, business journalism and rights of capitalism. So back to the Kiplinger letter, it is the oldest continuously published newsletter in the United States. It's uh, started a hundred years ago. It's um, the oldest newsletter was called the Whaley Eaton letter, which is good, but it, um, it failed sometime in the forties. And here is how the circulation of the Kiplinger letter took off. I know the, letter, the numbers are a little quiet here, but here's 1932, Rosa Bell gets elected, the circulation more than doubles, and then it keeps going up off this scale. This is 1940. It will go up to over 400,000 by the, by the 1960s. So 35,000 circulation up here. So you can just see that there is, you met this big need in, um, in the information uh, um, market. By the 1940s, Kiplinger is wealthy, becomes very wealthy, multimillionaire. Um, the Saturday Evening Post described him, described him as the best paid and most influential reporter in the world and the most independent. That's what they wrote in the 1940s. Um, Harper's Magazine reported that there is hardly a small town in the entire country that uh, doesn't have at least a few Kiplinger subscribers. Um, and one industry expert described Kiplinger as basically publishing in the Wall Street Journal of uh, newsletters. So his success spawned a lot of imitators. And here is an example of, um, I think this is U.S. News and World Report, completely ripping off 
the Kiplinger format. And uh, there were a couple of cease and desist list specific letters that sent to uh, US News and World Report. Um, Newsweek, Newsweek did this as well, the Calls Magazine, they were all you know, trying to mimic this style because it became so popular with, with business people at the time. You can see the, uh, you know, how similar they are. One of the innovations that, that Kiplinger did with writing was he invented a new writing style to communicate to busy people. He called this thing the sweep line writing style. And it basically violates all aspects of AP style. It is uh, completely ungrammatical. And it reads, it's just very weird to kind of read. And the idea is to underline the key facts Make sure the sentences don't break. This is a big violation. That this should have been um, full word there. So somebody can just like scan this really fast and get the essence of what was going on. He drilled and trained his his uh, his uh, writers to write in this style. And the idea was somebody could just pick it up, kind of scan this, this new letter for a couple minutes. And really, kind of get the essence of what was going on and, and, and move forward. So it was very popular with the business folks. The sweet line style really wasn't, um, didn't take off in journals. And thank God, I don't think anybody's going to write like this, but um, it does show his curiosity and his willingness to kind of, you know, push the boundaries of journalistic style in order to meet a need. I talked a little bit about, you know, getting your phone calls returned. This is something that's, you know, a problem for students, but a problem for the rest of us as well. Believe me, it's, uh, it's difficult. And you look at Kiplinger and the way he was able to get these calls returned is he understood that journalism is a people business. You have to maintain relationships. And he was, he was a master at this. So he was... He would get out there and meet people. He'd travel around the country, and then he would follow up and stay in contact. And so you can do the same thing today, you know, following his methods. If you write a story, send it to the source. Follow up with the source. What would you think of the story? Call up the source, maybe six weeks later. I haven't talked to you in a while. How's it going? You know, just try to get some tips. Try to keep that relationship going. And Kiplinger did this all the time. He also worked in this space back then of bringing in influencers to look at his work. So, you know, he didn't have social media, of course, you know, back then, but he would send the newsletter to powerful politicians and actors and so forth. Um, and then he'd send telegrams to get people's attention. So here's an example of this networking. This is the governor of New York at the time. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, 1931. Um, this gives you a sense of the original archival material I was working with for this book. It's this was one of thousands of uh, original letters with correspondence with presidents and business leaders that are in Kiplinger's family basement. Um, it really should be in the Library of Congress. And so Kiplinger has sent um, Franklin Roosevelt a copy of his newsletter and Roosevelt's writing back, yeah, I'd like to get, I'd like to get on your free subscription list. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, appreciate it. And so that's what this is all about. And in doing this, he gets his name kind of circulated in Roosevelt's cert, uh, uh, you know, community. And so people are becoming more familiar with him. This allows Kiplinger to network and get access to the people who are really making the decisions. He didn't want to really interview the presidents or the governors as much. He wanted to go a layer down or a layer down below that where the real experts were. And in that case, was this guy, Raymond Moley. Anybody ever heard of him? He's one of the architects of the New Deal. You guys know about the New Deal, created social security created the National Labor Relations Board, created um, any number of, of social service agencies, an incredibly revolutionary time in how the government dealt with the business community. This was the onset of a major regulatory revolution. 
this guy was at the head of it. He helped organize and set in, set in motion much of the New Deal. He was head of this thing called the Brain Trust. He's a Columbia University professor, and there were a bunch of uh, um, college professors who were advising FDR on how to um, to really rescue the, the American economy uh, during the Great Depression. His capitalism failed just as FDR came into office. We had all the banks shut down. So if you think about our US economy, it was dead in the water. And these guys had to figure out how to get it, get it back, get business confidence going, get people buying material. There was a line outside of Ray Moley's office in downtown Washington in the hallway for months. People wanted to go and see him. And Moley would leave a standing um, appointment every Friday for Kiplinger. Kiplinger would come in, and no matter what was happening, Moley would give him a briefing because he thought that this was some guy who understood what was happening in the business community. We need the, Ro the Roosevelt administration needed the business community to be on board for us to be politically successful. So I need to really kind of work on this relationship with this reporter. And so Moley told him everything that was going on. And the deal that they had was Kiplinger wouldn't quote him and um, and he wouldn't, uh, and he would uh, um, then kind of tell Moley about how Washington worked. Because at this point, Kiplinger had been in DC for you know well over you know maybe about 15 years. He knew how Washington worked. This guy was from New York, he didn't know. So it was a two-way street that was going on there that was really important. Um, and so that's the opening scene in my book is um, Willard Kiplinger is in a suit sitting in this really busy office, holding up a newspaper, and the President of the United States is on the phone with Ray Moley, trying to work out a problem, and he's just listening to everything that's going on. And then he's able to basically confirm this information later and report it and get these incredible scoops. So talk about the people, people part of journalism. He was able to establish the trust with this guy be able to hang out in his office every week and pay it off in great ways. Um, a little bit more about Kiplinger's method and how it's sort of current today. Um, he had a very active readership and they would always send him letters asking questions that really kind of pertain to what they were facing. You know, how do we get a hold of somebody in, at this particular agency? And Kiplinger would assign his reporters to answer the reader's questions. That was part of their assignments and get back to them within a couple of weeks. And so there was this very intimate relationship between the readers and the reporters. And some of these reader questions would come in from different parts of the country. They began to see patterns. They find stories by working this relationship with the readers. So this sort of reader engagement is sort of a gold stone of, of modern digital journalism. We would love to have readers come in and tell us what is going on, throughout their, you know, give us story tips and so forth. And here's an example of a, uh, of a bank president in Parsons, Kansas, writing to, um, uh, to Kiplinger, saying, I'm gonna re-up my subscription, and by the way, here's a story tip. So there's this, uh, this sort of synergy. He's using different parts of his business to advance his reporting. And because his reporting is advancing, his business grows. So it's a really, really clever way of, of you know, kind of integrating the marketing and the reporting, but not crossing the line where you're kind of selling out and, and doing people favors. You know, he's still trying to do independent journalism at the same time. It, um, it gets even more interesting, you know, he stays in touch with people like William McAdoo, who at this point in 1933 is a U.S. Senator from California. And McAdoo is now writing Kiplinger, like, what's going on? What the hell is the shooting all about? I'm a bonehead, no doubt. That's why I'm confused. 
tell me what's what's happening in Washington. He's out in LA and he, he doesn't really kind of understand what the current controversies are. This relationship started in the Wilson administration when McDo was a uh, this uh, low level treasury official and Kiplinger stayed in touch with him over the years. Now he's a U.S. Senator. He has somebody in the room that he can talk to during negotiations on real sensitive things. So that keeping those relationships going, I see this time and time again going through the archives of, of how this guy was just a military network. Then there are other, you know, sort of more obscure things. This is a, um, a telegram uh, from uh, Roy Rogers, uh, Will Rogers, who was a famous actor and comedian at the time. And Kiplinger had sent uh, Rogers a complimentary subscription. And uh, Rogers said, yeah, put me on your list. Um, but I sent the bill to Beverly Hills. A comedian is as unreliable sometimes as a walking the mover. <laughs> Will Rogers. So this was another attempt to get the influencers of the day to talk about you know, what was happening with the Kiplinger letter. And it was a, a pretty, pretty good strategy. Um, the tel telegrams in this era were really, uh, they're expensive, they caught your eye, and, and he would do these things all the time to, to let people know that they were important, that he wanted to keep this, this source relationship going, even up to almost when he was almost, uh, almost had died. So here's a telegram to Ray Bowie, reading your latest book, page 362. Touching base with important sources, letting them know that you care. Really an incredible reporting method. He would go around the country and speak at, um, at Rotary Club dinners and all these obscure Chamber of Commerce places. Might seem kind of out of the way, but this some of these things were incredibly important for building up his, his, his brand recognition. And uh, so he was branding himself in a very, very effective way back in the 30s and 40s. He did a lot of freelance writing on the side. I don't think the guy ever really slept, to tell you the truth, but he was enormously productive. Here are just a sample of some of the clips from the 30s. Um, and he wrote for the New York Times, big pieces in the Sunday New York Times about uh, about you know regulatory issues and then for Scribner's magazine. And then for this magazine called Today Magazine, which Ray Moley ended up being the editor, a guy who was Roosevelt's speechwriter and an important aide in the New Deal, ended up leaving the administration after a year, still was an, an important advisor, but he went into journalism. Today Magazine was later purchased by Newsweek. Ray Moley actually was a finalist to, in a group that was gonna buy the Washington Post back in the 30s. So he was at a pretty high level. And so what's interesting in this, there's another dimension of this relationship. And it's something I wanted to talk to you guys about. There's can be a two-way street relationship in reporting. You're not always just calling up somebody and getting information. If you can tell them something that could be useful, then you might be able to get calls back. I'm not talking about sharing confidential information, but just you know having something to talk to somebody about when you're doing an interview and can make it a much more um, fruitful conversation. In this case, Kiplinger was giving Moley a master class on how to be an editor and how to be a journalist. And so I, I ended up going through 250 letters between these, these guys from the 30s up to the 60s. And, um, and it was just really interesting to see how Kiplinger was providing the, the, the great um, classic uh, um, examples of, of, of great editing and reporting. Um, Kiplinger ended up taking a lot of chances with new technology. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit of that in a bit. But this is a strange, you know, sort of a kind of a multimedia um, uh, uh, opportunity back in, in uh, during the Great Depression. Philadelphia Orchestra on a national 
broadcast. And then during the break, Kiplinger would talk about business. It's so weird, you know. I, now there were during the intermission, he's going to talk about you know, bank regulation. But this got him, it's got his name out on a national broadcast. And so, uh, so I thought it was a little weird that the um, Hamilton Bank was sponsoring these things. Kind of a little squirmy, but this was a way for him to, uh, to again, you know, to try to, you know, use new methods of distribution, new methods of media to get his way um, and, and get his name out there. Um, Kiplinger later, you know, would file in the magazine, was involved with broadcasts, was involved in um, uh, software, websites, educational material, all of this coming from the base knowledge um, um, you know, knowing about regulation in Washington. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this whole business of newsletters that he was in. Um, it's called the Business to Business um, uh, uh, Specialized Journalism. And um, these are specialized journalism would be publications like Aviation Week and Space Technology or Broadcasting and Cable or even Billboard. You know, publications that really are very specific to uh, to a, uh, a certain community. It's kind of like neighborhood journalism for um, for business businesses. You know, if you think of one specific industry as a neighborhood, this is a huge area, and it pays well, and the stories are interesting. You just, you just won't find these publications to have large circulation, but you can have a great deal of impact. These publications brought in $37 billion in revenue in 2021. Getting that number took me three months. <laughs> and a lot of schmoozing. That's more than cable, TV, news, network, ads, 28 billion. Gives you a sense of the scale of this specialized journalism um, industry. And one of the things that you'll see these specialized publishers do is they'll start off with one great idea, and then they'll see like a, well, maybe we could expand and publish another kind of targeted newsletter for tax people, you know? They started that in the late 20s. So what about for farmers, you know? That, that was another one in the late 20s. And then, but well, we can just do books based on this stuff, kind of like repackage it and kind of like tell a bigger story in the book. So they started a line of books. We had to start a magazine, you know, after World War II, you know, we did that. Uh, school materials, we tried to teach people how capitalism works in the markets, videos, broadcast, I mean, um, even tax software, <laughs> all kind of drawing from this base of knowledge and expertise that they gained over the years. This is a typical model for, for specialized journalism. I see this time and time again, where they're trying to, what they say, monetize the intellectual property of, of the company and find new ways to draw revenue in. I think this is a model that a lot of mainstream publications are going to now. You see this with the New York Times, with the games and the paywalls for the recipes trying to monetize different parts of the business to bring in as much revenue as they can to survive. This is the Kiplinger magazine. It started off with this hideous title called The Changing Times. I don't know what they were thinking, but it's very important because it was the first personal finance magazine. So it um, found its voice showing people how to invest, talking about scams, writing about how to save for your first mortgage, how to, uh, how to put your kids to college, you know? And so this uh, personal finance genre became something very specific just to the magazine. The newsletter didn't do this at all, but this became a very popular and, and a big part of the Kiplinger publishing empire. That empire, by, by the way, was had an editing office just over in Hyattsville. Here, really about maybe about two miles from here. It had um, a direct marketing operation that was so large, it had its own zip code. Wow. 
they were probably the largest user of direct mail in the country, sending out subscription, you know, um, yeah. forms and uh, and managing the uh, the, the whole um, you know business. The, the company had about what you know the last decent numbers probably 125 people working for it. And it was sort of a good medium-sized company. They ended up staying afloat because Kiplinger invested very wisely in up in Gaithersburg and we were in you know, Bethesda and, and along the Potomac River. It became a real estate freak. And he bought a lot of real estate in, um, in Florida. And so the real estate was supporting the journalism for many years. And when I looked at the company, I told the different like, friends, and I said, basically, what you're running is a real estate investment company with journalism on the side. And he goes, yeah, that's what we're doing. So he thought of different ways to kind of, you know, get the, the and journalism supported outside of traditional models. And then just sort of coming up, you know, sort of wrapping it up, talking about how I did the research and so forth. This is Kiplinger's grandson, Knight Kiplinger. Um, outstanding individual, a great journalist. And I had no idea who this guy was. I sort of heard about him in 2019, and I had an assignment to write an encyclopedia article about this guy's grandfather. You know, So I didn't have any uh, background. I didn't know Willard Kiplinger from anything. So. I called one of my friends at the Kiplinger magazine. And she said, well, call Knight. You know, Knight, he'll probably help you out. We had a lot in common. Our first phone call went for an hour and a half. At the end of that phone call, he FedExed his grandfather's unpublished autobiography, her company's unpublished history, a couple books, and a bunch of clips. And to show respect for that archival, original archival work, and that stuff came in from FedEx. I dropped everything I was doing and went down to the school, put in the coffee pot, and hit the scanner and scanned it all and turned and got it back to him by FedEx the next day. I wanted to show the respect to a very valuable source at the beginning of the research. And I was going to handle his you know, really valuable personal information um, with the utmost care. That relationship was key. He ended up giving me access to the family's archives. And this is the basement of a, of a beautiful house out in uh, up beyond Potomac. There are, I think, 19 file cabinets. Kiplinger kept a carbon copy about everything he wrote from 1915 forward. He had, and so I saw original correspondence with Herbert Hoover, with Joe Kennedy, with Will Rogers, all that other stuff. Um, I'm actually talking to the library now about whether or not we want to try to get this into our special collections. It's an incredible archive. I got through just a small footer, but I knew what I was going after. And so he let me uh, go through that. And that was uh, a, a great uh, relationship. He ended up, um, you know, liking the book, but really had issues with my criticism of how we treated employees. He thought I was too harsh, but we got, um, we got to the, uh, you know, to a good place because I had enough reporting to back up why I thought his grandfather was a little bit manipulative of his employees. That's a, that's a whole other story about how that relationship worked. Um, so, see here, just wrapping up. I guess, you know, to conclude that, um, so Willard Kiplinger, I really think, could teach us a lot about modern journalism and the craft of reporting and how to build a successful business, right? And how to really produce interesting and important material. Um, Kiplinger stood out in his era by supporting capitalism, but he asked businesses to be socially responsible, and he was very, very different than other business journalists at the time. 
He wrote that businesses need to participate in the democratic process and accept compromises. And he wanted them to work with organized labor, which was a real heresy for a business reporter to say at the time. We learned, you know, from Kipling or how uh, a journalist can participate in the in the political space, you know, get advice to Ray Bowley and to these other people within the in the growth of all this administration. So he can participate in the political space, but he's not a partisan. He wasn't taking sides. He had his own ideas, but he wasn't a partisan. So this is, I think, a really provocative idea for all of us who try to move forward in our changing media landscape. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So my students know um, as a part of their extra credit, they were asked to come up with questions. And so if you would like to ask your questions, just introduce yourself, say your question, ask your question and Rob will answer it. So um, my professors, um, if you would give my students just a chance real quick to ask a few questions, I'd appreciate it. Robin, can I ask exactly. people sign the pizza sheet? Um, Maria threatened to hurt me. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, it's over here. Not really. We'll put it back around. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, if, I'm sorry. I saw you, uh, Dr. Chinoy. <laughs> if any of my students want to ask their questions, if they want to, yes. okay. Hi, um, I'm Sarah. Hi, Sarah. And my question is: Did learning about Kipling's approach to journalism change the way that you practice and teach journalism? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. It. Um, I was just happy to see that. He was doing some of the things that I kind of stumbled upon uh, later on in my career as a reporter. So I had an email list that I ended up calling the Scoop ATM machine, all right? Because it started like spitting out all these incredible tips. And this email list started out when I was at Dow Jones Newswires. Um, and I would write a story about what was going on in the Capitol. And I'd send it to my sources. And I'd wine coffee, maybe about 50 people. And then folks would come up, hey man, I get on this email list. You know, when you see it already, no, no, I want to get it in my email. And they like the convenience of it, you know. And so this thing kind of built up over time, more people on the list, gets up to three, four hundred people, you know, and I'm sending all my stuff out on this email list. And what happened was, and you guys should think about this. I was creating a presence in their digital life every day. So they would open their email, they'd see something, go, oh, I gotta send this to Rob. Reply, attach, send. And then I'd get like an internal document from the treasury. <laughs> it was a scoop ATM machine. It kept spitting out tips after I left after I left out jobs for two years. It was insane. So that was one thing that um, it was neat to see, you know, his, um, how much energy he put into building these relationships and maintaining them. And that just sort of reaffirmed something that I was doing. So I definitely talk about that <laughs> when I'm teaching before. Right. Um, Gibson, I was just wondering, when you were like doing your research, especially like going through the archives with his grandson, was there any like thing you found that you were like shocked to see and that kind of forced you to change like how you were wrote part of your book or like some stuff you weren't expecting? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I was expecting that uh, Kiplinger had a pretty strong Republican agenda because he was really strong um, for the business community. Um, I was I was shocked to see that he um, was favoring Richard Nixon over Tony Kennedy, and um, that he was actively working in the background of trying to bring up Nixon's profile. Um, and one thing that I kept looking like, always trying to find examples of where the journalists are tilting the scales or trying to like influence the process and insert themselves into the story. And there was one opportunity that he could have done that in 1935 when Ray Moley asked him to help him write a speech to this group called the National Association of Manufacturers. And that was almost like a MAGA group at the time. You know, they were very, very opposed to regulation, to, um, to Roosevelt's New Deal agenda. 
and here was someone from the Roosevelt camp going to talk to them. And he was beginning to sort of learn conservative himself. And so it took uh, nine months and multiple requests to the archives out in Stanford to get the original copy of the speech because I saw the notes that Kiplinger sent him. Kiplinger did not do, he, he wasn't trying to like kiss the butt of the uh, business community. He was telling them again, you need to tell them that you be socially responsible and that, that there's a social compact here. You have to accept regulation in order to be a good U.S. citizen, you know. And so I was surprised at that. And then, um, yeah, that was, that was definitely, so those are two of the things that sort of stuck out, the, the Nixon endorsement, and then a letter to his daughter about his political beliefs. I mean, pretty right down the center. Yes? Uh, what was the most challenging part of writing the book, and how did you overcome that? Um, this book was a freaking dream to write. <laughs> After the first interview, I get it. My main subject's autobiography that's never been published. I have primary source material that nobody had. And then, I, and then this, you know, I just keep getting more and more detail. Tell me about the business. You know, I'm like, I'm getting I can't find it. Yeah. Tell me more about this real estate business. Well, oh, yeah. Well, from our, our last two hour interview, you said this, and I kind of typed it all up. And he would provide even more detail. I said, well, I want to see the tax return. Give me tax returns. So um, I told you, it really wasn't um, difficult. It was just, I did all this in COVID, and I wish I could have gone back to the company archives three times. I only went there once. But I was, I'd done archival research before, and I knew enough to get into an archive, get one story. Go after one thing. Don't get distracted too much, but just make sure you get one thing nailed down. So I got that one thing nailed down. I wish I could have gone back more and 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 done other things. Um, but this, there was some sort of like preordained about this project that was just kind of eerie. I mean, it really, after that first um, conversation with Mike Kiplinger, I told my wife that I think my next book was just coming. Yes. Uh, my name's Ian. Hey, yeah. uh, my question is Did you have like an idea for the story before you began your research and your reporting, or did you gather all of your information first and then put the story together? So I had a general idea of what I wanted to do. I wanted to know find some like big explosive story that he did in the New Deal that everybody else followed. And it was more subtle than that. So I was looking for this big scoop of the New Deal. And it was more subtle. And that required me to kind of understand more about the New Deal. So I spent about six months just doing nothing but reading about the New Deal, which um, uh, that was amazing. So it's a process of like, you go in with an idea to try to, so you're not wasting your time. It's like, what's one story I could get out of this? And it's like, oh, that's not turning out. What's something that I've learned from researching that? In this case, it was like, there was this broader behind the scenes influence, which is why the book's called The Insider. He was working behind the scenes all the time. And, and he was part of this broader movement to try to save capitalists, you know, and so it required just a, like a lot more research and reading. Um, but I think it's a difficult balance doing archival research. You want to get one thing, but you want to keep your eye open at the same time. It's kind of like the frog with the eyes on both sides of the head. You, know? you want to keep your your peripheral vision on. Yep. Um, you mentioned how like how extensive, like how long it took for you to get all this research. I mean, like the focus wasn't even the New Deal and you spent six months researching it. What did like, in like very loose, like what did a day look like for you while you were like working and writing and researching? Um, I mean, I was getting up about 5.30 and writing for 
about two hours every day. Um, and then I'd go to school, and then I'd come home and do some more stuff. And then on the weekends, um, I was trying to get the full so I'd work all weekend. Um, and it was really it was like a real gift to be able to get into something that in depth and where I really felt like I had it, you know, felt like this was going somewhere and it was gonna be cool. Um sometimes I've done that sort of work and it was just like this is not happening, I've always been like on, oh, you know. But that was um that's basically, it was just an enormous amount of time. The main thing you want to do on one of these projects is you touch it every day. So I can't do two hours and I'm recently going to write for 30 minutes. Open that file, work on it every day. Because there's a mental momentum that you need to keep going. You need to touch the project every day no matter what, or you'll lose. Hey, John. Um. So I was wondering, like you said, you have like a good relationship with uh, your grandson. I was wondering when you're writing this type of like good like biography, like is it kind of hard? And then you're like obviously you have the generosity of these archives and whatnot. Yeah. Is it kind of hard to like put in all the information, whether it's like negative, like the worker, yeah. even though, even if you're like impressed with the guy, like you have to include everything. Yeah, yeah. It was um the very sensitive conversation. You have to think about strategy, and I talked to I think uh, I could talk to uh, Professor Feldstein about some of the problems I was having, and, and others just trying to figure out a way to navigate this. Knight Kiplinger is a very on honorable person because he would accept criticism of his grandfather if there was a reporting to back up, and I kind of understood that. So if I had the goods, then he would accept a negative narrative. And so I was just really lucky to be working with somebody who um, kind of accepted good reporting at that level. The biggest fight we had was over my characterization of Willard Kiplinger's philanthropy as, and, and his very generous pay packages as a form of manipulation and paternalistic operation in the newsroom. Um, and I found it to be basically a way to ward off the union and the print shop from coming into the newsroom, you know. Um, and I thought that was a very cynical and negative interpretation. I had 35 interviews with I have interviews with all the employees that were done for the sale company history, and they're talking about what a half hole <laughs> Willard Kiplinger was to them, and how demeaning he was at some time, and how he was using his money to sort of stage his guilt. So I had that, and I sort of denied it. Was still a sore spot. <laughs> but yeah. but um, I was just enormously lucky to be dealing with a gatekeeper who had integrity. And um, there was another case, my first book, um, the Ann Covers, uh, it was about a journalist who was uh, writing up in New York and broke a major investigative story in the, in the 80s involving uh, politics and finance. And I found something going through um, his daughter's, his daughter gave me all of her. And we all started going through it. And I found this, you know, he had a, he had a, a, uh, an addiction problem. And I said, don't, don't write about the addiction problem. I said, well, I might need to. I, said, I really don't want you to write about the addiction problem. And I said, okay. So I began to think like, how important was the addiction problem in the narrative, and how important was it for my access and the understanding? And so I didn't. I didn't think it was that important to the overall story. Um, so I honored the wishes to know. <laughs> wondering, like, obviously, it was very skilled, but never as you're talking about, really going to develop relationships with sources. 
like today, it seems like there'd be much less access to the kind of people to see what they want to get, which is like kind of blind to just by saying it like a telegram. How do you think that like take he did with his very monitor? I, I actually disagree. I think there were there would be plenty of access because Kiplinger was always talking like one layer down, you know. He wouldn't be talking to the senator, he'd be talking to the chief of staff. And so the way you build that access is you go to the senator's event, there's the chief of staff, you go over like, hey man, what about problem? Okay. So then you kind of build that up. So but you have to show up in person in order to get that initial trust happening. Um it can be with other beats and uh, Professor John Priest can tell you about national security. You know, you can't like even email to the CIA. You have to beat them in some other venue in order to build relationships. But um, at least the way the Washington was working when I, um, you know, stepped in a full time uh, term with me in 2012, I think it's, it's still possible. Yes. Uh, obviously, there was a thing I would change that in the bus with Linger, and now you know everything about the Linger. Not everything, but, but uh, as uh, as much as like probably humanly possible. Um, where do you think that point was where you're like, I think I am starting to gain like a strong understanding of who this person is? And, like, I think that was about a year and a half into it after I had done the reading on the New Deal and had read. A lot of Fortune magazine and New York Times coverage on the Great Depression. And I was able to contextualize him with like, oh my God, this is really bad. Like, what balls does I have? You know? Um, and I think that was the time where I really began to get excited. It's like, okay, this is a real very it's a deviation from the norm. And it's just so plain right there in this new book. Uh, I'm Bailey. I was wondering because I know you mentioned that, um, like, people when you're like this in contact with a bunch of senators and like well, soon to be senators, like people yeah. who were like going to be like prospering in like high positions in the future. And I know like times have changed since then. So I was wondering who you would like recommend like us like young journalists like to talk to to get into a good position like Kiplinger was in when he was kind of around our age. Yeah, sure. So I listen to Karen Denny. Everybody knows Karen Denny. <laughs> Karen Denny has the map. You get an internship, get experience. Um, what kind of field are you interested in? Uh, probably more like broadcast work. Okay. So you want to try to get into newsrooms as quickly as possible. And even when you're a freshman, you're doing your first stories for the guy in the back, or stories you need to show, start a spreadsheet. Write down all the people you talk to and everything else, keep that, and then go through that every six weeks. Like today, this hour will be source maintenance hour, and do that. And so, what I ended up doing was putting all of it in Google Contacts, and then it would sync with my phone across all different devices, and putting in notes so I could search the contacts. Someone who can explain the budget. <laughs> You know, someone who can talk to me about like police violence. You know, so everybody has their own system, but you need to just start out at least with a Google sheet and follow up and make that part of your routine. This is a great question. Yeah. So I am trying to figure out at what point if the well, that's a point. Kiplinger had his employees doing the writing. I mean, presumably from the beginning, he, he wrote these newsletters. He did the final write of, of the newsletter. And so did um, other people write those books or or he was using them? He, so he wrote the book and he took their research. <laughs> but the, the newsletter was produced by a staff of uh, in the 30s, I think they had about 10 reporters. They would write up memos and submit them for the newsletter and get them to rewrite them. Yeah. Put it in the style, and everybody was like, you know, 
was kind of a jerk about it, but boy, that was awful. Kind of, he was like, he was kind of a little bit demeaning in his relationship with him. But people learned if they could put up with it, they learned how to write better. They always, everybody, you know, they might have some issues with how, I don't know, you know, irritating he could be, but everybody respected his chops as a reporter and his kind of editor. I'd say he's probably the best writer there. Yeah. Yes. Um, my name is Will. Hey, Will. Really captivating, like, well, thank you. Um, basically, you mentioned how uh, Barry Mully in his private meeting with Kiplinger yeah. wouldn't allow um, Kiplinger to quote him on right. information he gave him. I was just wondering how exactly did Kiplinger go about, um, you know, sourcing that information in his writing? That's an excellent question, and I, I, I should have talked on that a little bit more. Kiplinger had this voice. Trust me, <laughs> I'm Willard Kiplinger. This is what I have figured out, and this is what my staff has figured out. He would not quote people, and there was very little sourcing. It was this kind of like voice of God sort of thing. But I don't know what would fly today with a lot of people. So I made hope that I you know. Um, and he wouldn't quote anybody. And the reason was in Washington, he thought that um, people were putting out public statements to manipulate a political game. And so he thought all quotes were worthless. So there were no, there's no quote, there are no quotes in the Kipling or Washington writer, and no real attribution. But the reporting was tense. That's the weird thing about it. So you don't see who the sources are. These people were really working very hard, multiple verifications. Kipler would not take it on a single story. It was definitely a very, very rigorous AP style reporting, you know, in order to get this. So, uh, a really controversial, um, uh, you know, news production with, with very little transparency about sourcing and no quotes. But they would, um, but it helped them. Can I, can I also ask? Yeah, sure. Um, how would you go about it today if you were, to, you know, if you today were to, you know, get an interview with some kind of Ray Molly guy and he said that you can't go me, I mean, you know, wait, I think you would, you would do that, uh, add a bit of training. Well, it, 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 at that point, um, he would say, hey, Ray Molly. We had a deal, man. <laughs> you were supposed to speak on the record. What's with this uh, sudden no quote thing? And like, well, I don't want you to quote about this. Like, well, I need you to talk on the record. Or my readers aren't going to believe it. So you negotiate that. And if he says, no, you can't quote me at all. Like, um, I don't know if it's really worth my time to talk to you. You know, they kind of like work through it. Maybe it is, maybe just for my general education. This person knows so much, but with those situations, with the source, you need to sort of a, a negotiation you're going to have with each individual. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, this is our last question. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, this is our last question. Okay. And, um, well, this is fantastic. And I love the way you put oh, it you. You made it relevant. It's really beautiful. So, I would okay. like take up your challenge about um, history and journalism. And I thought I was looking to see if anyone mentioned Willard Stricklitcher in the news. You know, this long dead guy in the news last year, I came across an analysis piece in Washington Post titled The Journalist from the Past Whose Ideas Could Save the Media in 2022. And lo and behold, you wrote it. So, <laughs> so, so of course, I'm interested to know how you got to the Post, but I'm interested in what, what, what about him could save journalism? Yeah. This business model that he has allows the intellectual property of reporters to generate new revenue streams. So all the expertise that you have in a newsroom can be um, can be potential new sources of revenue through low cost publications like newsletters. I think it's a brilliant idea, and it's certainly something. The Times, Wall Street Journal, everybody else is trying to do. Um, he was a very public figure trying to push for the improvement of journalism. He was 
one of the founders of the Washington Pressbook Foundation um, in their education mission. So it is, um, there's always talking about ethics and, and reporting standards. Um, and just the, you know, just how audacious he could be. The fact that he would take these, these weird risks and, and they would pay off through his hard work. Um, and I think it's just, the thing, I mean, a lot of journalists work hard before they look at it, but this guy's work at it, of course, is insane. He's, he basically, they have the old typewriter in the basement. I don't uh, a picture right here, but I don't think it's just people. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fantastic question, Dr. Tanoi, and a great way to end today's talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. More pizza. We have plenty of pizza. My students will be on Thursday. If anybody wants a copy of the book, we got it. Right. 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 Yeah, we'll get that. Yeah,